talk to my dad, I said, uh, hey dad, for some more to move in for Congress. He goes, why not? He goes, I went to school with his mom. I knew his mom before, you know, his dad. And I said, really? I said, where? He goes, we went to school together at St. Joe's Catholic School in Chicago, in Calumet. So all the pieces just kind of fit together, and it was a no-brainer. He is a great man. He comes from a great family. He has a great family. And he does great things for Township. And I'm really, really, really anticipating what he's going to do for Congress. So I can't wait. You know, time is of the essence. And I think when I, you know, when Frank gets up in the morning and he goes to work every day, the work that he does is probably very different than a lot of other politicians, especially the ones that he's potentially going to be running against in this race. Frank's work is reaching out and touching every single person in the community and seeing how he can help them. He listens to their stories. I've seen him time and time again. You know, he's absent a lot from the house, but he's always present for our daughters. And so he has such a fine balance between taking care of people in the community and providing a wonderful life for, you know, myself and our daughters. And so as he stands here and, you know, he puts himself out there as he's going to run for congressman, uh, you know, the only thing I can say is that the importance of everyone doing their part. There's no way he's going to get elected alone. He's going to need all of you to help him in this room, along with your families and your friends. Um, you know, there are many ways to help volunteering, um, supporting financially, uh, just talking. Word of mouth is the most important thing, so what you can do is talk to your friends. But Frank's body of work has really, really been an important body of work. Everything from working with the veterans to making sure that our children are safe. Not only safe at school, but safe in their homes with his No More Secrets campaign. And so that's probably my favorite piece of work he's done thus far. It personally involves me and my sister and my family. And I'm grateful to Frank and his team for the work that they have done on this. Myra, Albert, Myra Rodriguez is here as well. And, and Isha, they've teamed up and... They've done a beautiful job with going into the schools and protecting the children. So he, his arms stretch out far when he is serving and helping others in our community. So please, um, all I can ask of you is to, uh, is to share who he is, understand who he is, and share with all your friends and families. I wanted my vision to start here in East Chicago. And it all kind of came together. So a congressman who is, res who is respected, he retired and there was an opportunity. And so you know my history, my father ran for mayor a very long time ago. And one of the lessons I learned when one of his races came about is you either decide and you're in right away or you're left behind. And that's why I decided to be Frank Ravan, a candidate for U.S. Congress. And most importantly, why it's important to me in being in East Chicago, I'm going to mention a lot of different factors. My mom grew up on Calumet, went to St. Joe, which is the fire station now. My dad grew up on Butternut. Uh, and he's been a banker at First National Bank in East Chicago for 43 years, which is now the Walgreens. So I know East Chicago and I know East Chicago politics. But something that just drove me from day one when I got elected to the North Township Trustee's Office is not only the excitement, but how we take politics and government so seriously. I know that politics sometimes here separates families and it brings people together. So I have an understanding that makes me a better politician than most. And what I want to tell you about what we've done at the township, it's going to be relatable on how I believe it will work on Washington, D.C. So just off the top of my head, in East Chicago, what we had did from the very beginning when Mayor Copeland became mayor was when there was a crisis with the water boil, our township came and gave water to about 20, about 2,000 to 5,000 people. That's small beans that people appreciate it. We make phone calls to senior citizens and make sure that they are taking care of an inclement weather in, uh, with uh, winter, uh, with snowfall, and we also provide dial ride. But the main thing is, is that we're present. We've gone door to door with the police department. We've knocked on doors, and when people said we need assistance, we know what is going on. We know that this is a community that is thriving and needs jobs. We know that Inland, or Arcelor Middle is the economy or the strength of our economy that makes us all work. But what we have to do is be able to find opportunities for our kids because that's a maturing industry. So we must be able to create new environments and new industry that brings in people. So when Caesar's son comes back with an electrical engineering degree, mechanical engineering, he knows that he has a job. 
And that job is a solid job because you want to attract and you want to bring your kids back together so that family base is always strong and always working together. So East Chicago is unique in the sense that it is a strong community and we have been there. I have walked on the streets. One of the greatest things that we ever did was when the lead crisis came, my office worked and helped relocate about 600 families and worked with the East Chicago Housing Authority. So what we learned is what, how that works and how people need housing and what goes on when things are contaminated. We worked with the federal government to make sure the EPA was protecting those folks and we made sure that those individuals going door to door had the proper protection that was necessary. So in Washington, D.C., when you look in the eyes of families, because I was present at all the forums, and they're saying, I have to be relocated. They had a very normal response of anxiety and certainty of what was going on. And the EPA was given answers like, well, we're going to, we should, we might. Well, the fact of the matter is, the EPA should be protecting us, and there should always be a balance, especially in our community, between industry and how safe our environment is. What we also need to learn is that in our communities, in the urban areas next to industry, you have a higher rate of asthma. So, and you have a higher discharge of poison in the water. So Lake Michigan is a national park now. And we've got to be able to protect people in our assets to make sure that the industries is polluting our greatest asset. So that's what I'm going to do. That's what carries over to Washington, D.C. And my wife mentioned the schools. In East Chicago, we worked hand in hand with the schools. One of my proudest accomplishments with Stacy and with Vanessa and with the school board is the ROTC program. I am very humble and I don't like to brag, but everybody gave up on that, on that commitment. Everyone said that that couldn't be done and that is a game changer. And myself and Colonel Liggins worked through a lot of obstacles with the Department of Defense who was eliminating the ROTC program. And what that does is that gives pride to our community. The ROTC program reinstates pride into a school and it reinstates pride into the community when those young kids walk around in their uniform. And we were instrumental and on the ground floor of doing that. Also with the school system. <laughs> quick, quick tip, because I'm a human, if you ever run for office, get a clap buddy. That's <laughs> So with the ROTC is important, but on a smaller scale, which was important to Gilda, and Gilda deserves the recognition for this, and Vanessa. So we worked with Pam, who is an angel on earth. She is in charge of the special ed department for the school city of East Chicago. So what we did is we identified the special needs kids in East Chicago, and then we trained through our social worker team. We went with the Indiana Autism Society, we partnered up with them, and we went to the police department. And we trained the police department on how to respond to a home that has people with autism or special needs. And once we did that, then we went to the parents of the special needs family and we trained them what to expect if a policeman comes to their home. So that both entities, because there are escalation with people with autism, when they see lights, they have a fight or flight kind of situation. And so what we did is we trained both parties to be able to be sensitive to that issue because there was an incident. And how it started for me was that I was sitting at a table and someone said, a sister was telling me a story of the brother. The brother went to go pick up medication, lived in East Chicago for his father who had cancer. Went through Illinois state line and was pulled over because he went through a stop sign. He was nonverbal and he was arrested. His sister couldn't find him. For three days he spent time in jail. And so what we did is we worked on being able to make sure that those individuals are aware and they also had bracelets and or a necklace that would have a number that would go into the dispatch system with Spillman. So if someone is nonverbal, they would have this and the police were trained to be able to eliminate escalation. So for years, four years, at least four, I've been working on hand-to-hand -hand combat on how to help people. For 10 years, we've had English as a second language that Judith has ran from Our Lady of Guadalupe out of our circle of service with Oscar Sanchez. So we have been on the front lines of that. So you, are, you have to decide, because this is what's going to happen, you've got to decide pretty soon what are the defining factors between the two candidates. I have absolutely positively lived, walked, and talked what I do and what I say. So when I talk about an immigration policy, I'll know what it means to people 
of Latino and people of all cultures that need help and need assistance, but yet protect our borders. And on the steelworker side, right now, right today, we're planning a uh, work to learn program with the 175 workers from US Steel that were laid off uh, probably about a month ago who just lost their health care on December 1st. I've looked into the eyes of those guys. I know what it is for the guys who are under three years that aren't going to get called back. I've talked to the people who are absolutely worried and scared that their kids aren't going to have health care. And I understand we have to have a system that protects those kids with health care. So what I'm asking you to do today is know that this, as your trustee, these skills are transferable to Washington. I will be here and I will never ever turn my back on East Chicago because I have proven myself day in and day out for 15 years to be an advocate and to be someone you can count on. So what I'm asking you today is just to fight the good fight verbally. And what I mean by that is for the next 30 days what it's going to be about is positive talk. Frank Ravan has produced. Frank Ravan has the capabilities to be able to be my congressman. And more importantly, do not be intimidated because that's what they're banking on. They're banking on that I'm going to be intimidated and scared, and what they don't know is I came from Hammond, I worked on the streets, and I walked down. One of my greatest stores, this office, especially here in Chicago, has taken notice of your needs in the community. And your needs and what you need is a strong congressman that is authentic. Yeah. A strong congressman yeah. that is not looking to find enemies in a fight, yeah. but looking to bring people together. And I have done that not only in this community, but throughout all of Northwest Indiana. I represent Whiting, Hammond, Highland, Munster, East Chicago. And I have to be able to work with all types of government officials to be able to get things done. Right. I never had to beat up anyone in others' communities to accomplish anything. So what we talk about, when we talk about the economy, we absolutely are going to stick with the steel workers and the steel union. And when we talk about trade, we must be able to talk about strong trade laws that absolutely does not put us in a position that when someone violates it on globally dumping steel in our community, which affects our workers, that we are protecting ourselves prior to that happening. Because what's happening at our solar miller, our solar emitter, when they put when they pollute the water, it's cheaper for them to pay fines than it is to put them in a new system that has their, uh, zero discharge. Yes. But the fact of the matter is, is immigration, very very hot topic. Come, wow, high pitch. Very, very, very hot topic coming in 2020. So everyone in this room, and even myself, we want to live in a country that absolutely protects our borders and makes sure people who are coming into our country are absolutely not dangerous. But I also want to let you know that we have DREAMers and we have DACA, DACA recipients who are here. And what the township has done for four years? For four years. Uh, Myra Rodriguez Alvarez, who is an immigration attorney who worked out of my office uh, for four years. So we have partnered up with Catholic Charities in East Chicago. And they have a phenomenal immigration program that helps people who are here trying to find a pathway to citizenship. And what we've done is the day, and I, I'm, I, it, the, the day Myra and I met, uh, which is a great story, she complained about the township because uh, someone treated her bad. She was screaming at me and I said, what do you need? And she said, I need a job. And I was like, well, all right, you're hired. And that's, that's as real as it gets. Uh, and when I say screaming, I mean screaming. But the fact of the matter is, is that together we have built a relationship with Catholic Charities. And this is a story that's real. Dr. Finley called and said, we have a student that is a senior in high school, and when everything was going on with ICE, the mother and father separated. The father went to? Uh, out of the country. Went out of the country, and the mother no longer wanted anything to do with the child left. And the son was in the top 20% of his class. And he was a DACA re recipient. And what happened was he was, he was working construction and maintaining a household and also taking care of a 14-year-old brother. <laughs> and so the school city of East Chicago called the township trustee's office, and we were able to work with them to be able to get him situated with his DACA. But what was going on is there was a reverse clock going on because he was about to turn 18, and if he didn't have his citizenship or wasn't in, uh, documented in the country officially, then he would no longer have custody of his younger brother and he would be a ward of the state. 
And that was real life. So when people talk about success, we were able to help that young man become a DACA recipient, which allowed him, what also was going on, is he got a scholarship from Valparaiso University. Until that DACA was official, he couldn't get it. Now he's at Valparaiso University, he still sustains his brother in life, and we were able to make his success on a federal program. That was right here in East Chicago. And why that's important, and I'm going to close on this because it's a special day and I will not cry. <laughs> Alright, no more secrets. I'm going to close on this. And it's legislation and this is what's important. No more secrets. It's a law in the state of Indiana. And it all started with her. Okay. So, uh, No More Secrets is a, a law that makes it mandatory for all school systems in the state of Indiana to be able to uh, have a curriculum to talk about child molestation. So let me tell you why. Indiana is ranked second in the country about child molestation cases. Okay? And Indiana University put out a study. Lake County is number one, Porter County is number two. So this is, this is kind of, uh, it's going to be touching, but it's real. So. Uh, Jane is a survivor, and her sister is a so survivor. Uh, today is Kelly's birthday, uh, and she's no longer with us. She had passed away. So what happens very often in real life is people who go through childhood trauma uh, turn to drugs or alcohol or opiates. Some are thrivers and some get the help that they need. And Kelly uh, turned to opiates to hide that icky feeling she had from the trauma she got as a child. And so in my office as a township trustee, people who come in and are chronically going through a poverty cycle have gone through childhood trauma. That's a fact. They can't get up, they can't go to work, they can't go to school, they can't do simple tasks. And so what Jane always wanted was to be able to make sure kids were educated about predators and what predators do and body safety. So we put a program together and Myra wrote the law and another survivor, Isha, came to us and we partnered up with the U.S. District Attorney's Office who gave us credibility. We partnered up with the Times, we partnered up with Fairhaven which is the Rape Crisis Center and we went into the schools. And everyone said, why are you talking about that? You run Wicker Park, you have dial ride you help the poor, why are you talking about that? Because it impacts poverty. And the more you talk about something, the more you shed light on it, the bigger you give an education, you accomplish Jane's goal of kids talking about it and parents talking to their kids about what happens. So we went and we talked to 11,000 kids and we had Child Protective Services with us. 73 came forward and they were substantiated cases. 73. The first time someone walked up, I was shocked. I asked Myra, why do we have to have Child Protective Services with us in our forum? She said, well, what if kids come forward? So how that, what that does is that provides those kids a better chance. The younger and the quicker they're able to get the help that they need and the support they need to get out of that environment because one in four girls, one in six boys go through that. And what I want you to know, and that's according to the CDC, the sooner they get help, the better outcomes they have. So this is a story that's real. So as we're doing this, collecting the data and talking to the kids, my father is passed, trying to get this legislation passed at the same time. So he gets it through the Senate and it's in the House. And the chairman of the Edu Commission, Education Committee holds it up because he thought that that was a social issue that parents should be talking about their kids and it's not a teacher issue. Right? No. And that's a very conservative view. And in light of that, there was also a suicidal bill that was going through. But we went down and they were going to give us, a, in the last day, they were going to give us a hearing. And what they were going to do is put the bill in sunset, which is code for they were going to put it on a shelf and you'd never hear from it again. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we went down and we told our story. And Isha was phenomenal and very charismatic. But she used the data of the 73 kids coming forward. And that chairman in front of the entire chamber did one thing. He had a moment of truth because he heard Jane's voice and Kelly's voice. And what he said is, I have a 36-year-old daughter who has been in prison for six years because of drugs. We adopted her. And she was abused sexually as a child. Had she gotten the help earlier, then maybe she would be in a better place. And then they passed the bill and the governor signed it. And it's law. And every day, and every day, every day, kids are being educated and they're coming forward and they're knowing they're not alone. And that is very important. They're knowing they're not the only person that ever has gone through this and it's making an impact.
So if someone says to you, well, what legislative experience does Frank Mervan have? You say, well, let me tell you about No More Secrets. Because we changed the state of Indiana by my dad's hard work and by my wife's vision. We changed the state of Indiana and we're educating young kids and we're making sure that they're safe. 